Hey everyone, welcome back. In this video, we'll continue with our exploration of how to code time series with real data. And the focus of this video will be the Surima model. Now, if you remember from our theoretical discussions on building up all of these models, Surima was one of the more complicated ones we built up, but it's really not that complicated because we can think about each part individually and each part itself is not too difficult. So again, just to recap, Surima, the letters stand for seasonal, autoregressive, integrated moving average. And let me just give a quick blurb about what each one means. The S is seasonal, which means we're doing some seasonality, some seasonal component in our data, which we'll see today. The AR is, of course, the autoregressive. The MA is the moving average. And the I is integrated, which means that there is some kind of trend in the model that we have to account for. So each part individually makes sense. So together, we'll see how we can think about a Surima model applied to real data. Today we'll be using catfish sales data. So as always, I'll provide a link to the data. And of course, this notebook will be available on my GitHub so you can play around with it for yourself. So let me first introduce you to this data. The first couple things I won't go over again because it's me just using the pandas library in Python to read in the data so that we can best plot it. So that's what these first couple lines are doing here. The main thing I want to show you is what the data looks like. So the data is for several years, but we'll just be limiting it to 1996, so starting in 96 and ending of the year 2000. So we're dealing with four years of data here. Now on the y-axis we have sales, so this is catfish sales in thousands of pounds. And then of course on the x-axis we have years. Now before even doing anything, there's a couple things we can notice just by the chart. We see there's definitely some kind of upwards trend, because here in the year 96 we have the mean around maybe little around 20,000, but by the time we get to the year 1999, the mean has, of course, jumped up to something around 24 or 25,000. So it's definitely increasing over time. We also see strong evidence of seasonality, because if we look within each set of gray bars, so within each year, we see a very similar pattern through the course of the year. So these are things we'll want to account for using the Surima model. The first thing, the first question we want to ask is, what order Surima model should we use? What order should we use for the AR? Uh, what order should we use for the seasonal AR and the seasonal MA parts? So let's try something. Let's first remove the trend. So what I've done here is taken the first difference, which means basically just taken each data point and subtracted the data point for the month that comes prior. And that reminds me that this is monthly data. So within each year, we have 12 observations, one for each month. If we do that, so this is uh, taking the first difference, we see that now it's centered around zero. So there's no upwards or downwards trend, but we still have the seasonality, of course. So this is us taking the first difference. So this means that we might want to use a integrated order of one because taking the first difference seems to make it stationary. Of course, we should do some tests on stationarity to be sure, but we won't be doing that in this video since the focus is on the Surima model itself. The next thing we can do is take the ACF and PACF of this first difference data to get an idea of what order we should use for the seasonal AR and seasonal MA parts. The ACF looks like this. We see there's not a ton of significant lags until we get to this one at 12. So we see that at 12 months lag, or another way to say that is at one year lag, we get some significant behavior in the ACF, which is why we have a note saying, based on the ACF, we should start with a seasonal MA process. And what kind of seasonal MA process? A seasonal MA process with lag of one year or 12 months. Let's look at PACF. PACF has a very similar behavior, not a lot going on, until we get to around lag 12, where we have this big spike. So again, based on the PACF, we should start with a seasonal AR process, again, with lag 12 months or one year. So let's get the training and testing sets and then go ahead and fit our Surima model. Getting the training and testing sets is the same as in previous videos. We decide that we're going to end our training set in July of 99, and we'll end our testing set in January of 2000. So looking at the graph, what that means is that we're going to end our training around here, the middle of 1999, and then we're going to end our testing about six months later at the beginning of the year 2000, which means that we're trying to predict about six data points or six months of data. Now here's the main important part of this video, fitting the Surima model. So there's two different sets of orders we need to fit. There's going to be the order for the regular AR, I, and MA parts, and the order for the seasonal AR, MA and I parts. Now, if any of that is unclear, go ahead and watch my theoretical video on Surima because I fully explain what all of this means in that video. But how to understand this, these three numbers here are basically gonna stand for the AR, 
I and MA orders for non-seasonal component of the model. And then in the seasonal component, we have the AR, I, and MA for the seasonal components of the model, again, pertaining to autoregressive, integrated, and moving average. And this last parameter here is just the frequency of the data, which basically just says that uh, how many data points do you have per year. And since we have monthly data, we have 12 data points per year. Now to explain why I have the orders I do, I have a AR and MA order of zero for the non-seasonal part because I see that I have pure seasonal behavior in my AR and MA, but I have an integrated one in my non-seasonal part. Why? Because when I took the first difference of the data, that was what got me stationarity. And that first difference was purely between one data point and the next, so that had nothing seasonal about it. So that's why I chose this as my order. And then I've chosen this as my seasonal order because I have a seasonal AR of one, seasonal MA of one, and the integrated part zero. So that's why I've chosen the coefficients I have. Now, uh, putting these coefficients in the model is pretty easy. You use this Surimax function. Where does it come from? Let me jump up to my imports. That came from the statsmodels.tsa.statespace.surimax. So that's a mouthful, but you import the Surimax model. Now, we haven't talked about what this X means. We won't end up using it in this, but that basically stands for exogenous variables. So no need to worry about that right now. So going back here, we basically just put in our training data first. We put in the non-seasonal order of the model. We put in the seasonal order of the model. And you can put a couple other things in. You can go ahead and research this uh, function. But this is the minimum stuff you should put in. Now we train the model. We see it takes only about half a second. So we fit the model here. And then we look at the summary. So let's spend a little bit of time looking at the summary, see what's significant. There's only two parameters here we really care about the seasonal AR part. So this is 12 months lagged AR, and then this is 12 months lagged MA. Why are those the ones that show up? Because we chose to include a 12 months or one year seasonal component for both the AR and MA parts. We see the coefficient on the AR part is about 0.8, which basically means that there's a positive relationship between the 12 months lagged series and the series today. And then we see that the MA 12 months lagged has a negative 0.5 coefficient. So there's a negative relationship there. More importantly, let's look at the p-value. We see the p-values for both are very, very low, which means both of these are significant and we were correct to include them into our model. So that's most of the information here. There's other good information that we may analyze later on. Now the last part is getting the predictions. Again, this is very similar to past videos, so I won't dwell on this too much, but here are our residuals. Now most of you are probably very concerned because zero is up here. And our residuals are all negative, which means there's a systematic uh, bias in the direction we're predicting. And we can clearly see that again if we plot the predictions versus the real data. So here's our four years of data. The orange line is the data we tried to predict. And then the blue line below is the actual value. So we see that we're pretty much matching the shape, but we're always over predicting. And part of the reason that this is happening is because we're trying to predict so many periods in advance. So let's try a different technique. Let's try the rolling forecast origin. Before I get to that, without the rolling forecast origin, with this straight up six months prediction, we're getting about 4% error, and our root mean squared error is about 1100. So let's see if we can do better using a rolling forecast origin. Now I have a whole video on evaluating time series models where I more deeply go into the idea and the motivation behind a rolling forecast origin. But the layman's perspective is that instead of predicting six months right off the bat, we predict just one month. And then we take into account the real value at that month, and then we predict the next month, and so on, so that we should get better predictions than this. So again, I won't go into this code. This is just a for loop that's predicting uh, one month forward each time. And each time it predicts one month forward, it takes into account the data from previous months. Doing that, we get these residuals. So we see this is much better because they seem to be more centered around zero. Maybe not exactly. It seems like maybe there's still more of a negative bias, but much more centered around zero than this that we got up here. So already good news. And if we plot the predictions versus the actual, this is what we get. And this looks a lot better than the predictions that we got before because this matches up with the signature of the data a lot better. There's of course some error. And looking at our metrics, we went from about 4% error to about 3% error, so less than 3% error, which is good. And we went from about 1100 root mean squared error to just around 800. So this is clearly a stronger prediction. And it is somewhat justified because we could say that we only ever want to predict one month ahead each time, maybe one or two months, but maybe it's less likely for us to want a very strong prediction six months out today. So 
there is some justification in this. So this was all about a Sarima model, how to look at the data and realize that maybe I should use a Sarima model here, how to look at ACF and PACF to further make that judgment call, and then based on those results, how to fit a Sarima model, how to analyze the results to see if the coefficients are or are not significant, and then how to get the predictions and the residuals from the Surima model. Okay, so if you have any questions at all, please leave them in the comments below. If you like this video and want more videos on time series analysis, go ahead and subscribe, and I will see you next time.